my topic tonight is called the importance of biblical literacy the importance of biblical literacy and one of the main emphasis that i want to underline that is how that biblical literacy helps us to not be deceived um it's very important i'm going to bring up some scriptures in a minute that actually specifically bring that to um light but i just want to highlight my topic again the importance of biblical literacy i have a few special verses that i want to touch on as i begin but when it comes to biblical literacy i believe that that is the ultimate protection for us in terms of dealing with the deceptions that are ever before us whether it's in the church understanding the word of god or the many evil things that are coming upon us this word of god and a proper biblical literacy of it is what's going to protect you from being deceived it's a command actually that christ gives us luke 21 and 8 jesus said take heed that you be not deceived for many shall come in my name saying i am christ and the time draw near go ye not therefore after them it's another one found also in matthew chapter 24 verse 4 it's jesus again speaking and he says and jesus answered and said unto them take heed that no man deceive you i want to emphasize that this is not a suggestion from christ it's a command that we have not to be deceived and the logical question is how do you keep from being deceived and and that's what i want to get into tonight but i also want to emphasize when we're dealing with biblical literacy the more you get into the word of god and get properly literate in it in terms of rightly dividing that word of god that's the change that happens in your life as pastor had mentioned before that i have been brought up to know god my mother was a pastor for over 30 years but she brought us up from as far as like my my earliest memories to know god and to fear god what i have learned in my life experience is that knowing god knowing that there is a god believing that there is a god doesn't necessarily help you one specific scripture that comes to mind is the one i i believe is in james it, it says that the demons also believe and tremble so belief in and of itself is not going to do much for your life but what i have experienced in this change in my life it's the more that i have given myself over to the word of god and i'm not talking about becoming knowledgeable about god about knowledgeable about the things in the bible stuff but taking the word of god understanding exactly what god is saying in this world to me and applying it to my life is the real application of understanding what the word of god is saying in your life saying to your life that makes the whole change i couldn't get this type of growth in god this closeness to god if i did not take the word of god serious and those that know me very closely know that most of my free time is spent on rightly dividing the word of god for the main purpose of changing myself of becoming more what christ would have me to be proper biblical literacy has helped me to grow has helped me to get closer to god has helped me to surrender my life to god and that's what i want to get into tonight this is a passion i have studying the word of god because when we properly study it it protects us it's a protection for us but it also enables us it gives us holy bones it helps us to be really um effective in our work and our walk with god and our work for god 
understanding the word of God and studying it with a mindset to actually obey it. Not hearing these great stories and stuff, but looking at how it can change your life. This is what's made the difference in my life. Many prayers have gone up for me for decades from my mother, from many other people, from a loving wife. But it's when I took the word of God serious and got into it and sought God in it and took that word of God with a mindset that I'm going to do as the Holy Spirit reveals truth to me. And the more the Holy Spirit revealed truths to me, and the more I applied it to myself, I realized that the Holy Spirit continued to open more scripture to me and give me more clarity. And it reminds me of that verse in the Bible where Jesus said that to him much is given, much is expected. And he also said that he that hath um, shall be given, and he that hath not even what he hath shall be taken away. And I've always took that to mean that when God gives you truth, when, when God gives you revelations, if you don't do nothing with it, it's going to end up taking even that away from you. But if you do something with it, he'll give you more. He'll give you more. And that's what's, that's what's been my excitement in rededicating my life to God and getting into this word of God. So what I want to do tonight is highlight uh, um, some different ways of studying the word of God, different ways of highlighting how the Holy Spirit moves in the work world. What I want to do is excite you about taking the word of God seriously. Because whenever you take that mindset, whenever you open that word of God up, the Holy Spirit has nuggets and truths waiting for you. But we have to present ourselves in this time of study before God, in this time of, of getting into God's word, with a mindset that I'm looking to learn something from God. I'm looking for new truths. So I'm going to highlight some of the stuff that I have learned and some of the ways that I do study. And before I go any further, I want to go look at Acts 17, 11, and 12, because this is what I believe, I'm especially being in this position as a person that is uh, I'm preaching now and a person that is teaching. This is what I stand on when I present the word of God to people. It says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and such the scriptures daily, rather those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. What is that scripture saying? I'm going to get to it in a second, but let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, emphasis on this word, huh? rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's go back to what we read first in um, Acts 17. That is one of the most important mindsets that any child of God should take upon themselves. Paul in Acts here is talking about the fact he had just left Thessalonica and he met up with these Bereans. And what is saying here is that these guys here are even better than the ones in Thessalonica. People were saved in Thessalonica, but these guys here are not only taking the word of God that I'm presenting to them, but they're going home and searching the scriptures for themselves to see if what I'm saying is really true. And each of us have that responsibility. So tonight, when I present stuff to you, and some of the stuff a lot of you may know, and some of it may be brand new to you, but what my challenge is, you're not responsible to take my word. What I'm going to do is just bring forth scripture, and your responsibility is in your time. Search them scriptures to see what I'm talking about, if it's true, and let the Holy Spirit reveal truths to you. But take the mindset that I'm going to get into the word of God. And that's the main thing that I want to bring out tonight, the importance of proper biblical literacy, taking the mindset that I'm going to stay in the word of God. 
Peter talks about, uses the expression that, and he says, as newborn babies, the sire, the sincere milk of the word of God. A newborn baby is completely dependent on milk. Get the mindset of completely dependent. We fool ourselves and set ourselves up for deception, pitfalls, shortcomings, when we don't have a proper view of the word of God, a proper appreciation for the word of God. Paul goes on and tells Timothy, take this word and study it so that you don't need to be ashamed. You should be able always to rightly divide this word of God and be able to present it to somebody. I think Peter talks about the fact that, that we should always be ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that we have in Christ. But it's going to come from a proper understanding of the word of God. You can't just take the word of God up and just read it just to say that I read something. You need to go into the word of God every time you go there. I want to hear from God. A lot of people want to hear this voice from God. But I want you to know that God speaks to you every time you're interested. It's in his word. Go to his word and you will hear from him. He has a special editor called the Holy Spirit that will point you to new truths in him. One of the reasons that I'm very passionate about the word of God is because uh, um, in studying, Shakan is doing it right now, studying Revelation. We understand clearly that we're living in those last times. And living in those last times means that we need, like Elijah said to Elijah, I want a double portion of what Elijah's got. We look at Paul, we look at Peter, we look at James and all these great past apostles and great men of God. And we say, man, these guys were so powerful. They had their challenges, you understand? But they were very powerful and effective men of God. What I realized is that we need double what they have because they're not facing half the stuff that we're facing now. So we need to be not praying not just to be like Paul and to be like Peter. We may need to be praying for a double portion because they weren't dealing with this online stuff and dealing with this new world that we're living in right now. So we need that extra start from God, and we're only going to find it in the Word of God. Let's look at 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachings, having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. This is Paul, again, speaking to Timothy, talking about in these last days. He's talking about our days. He's talking about in our time right now. This is what we are up against. This is what so many people who are supposed to be taking on the name of God are getting caught up into. They've got itchy ears. They want to hear what they want to hear. What's going to keep you is having a proper biblical literacy of the word of God. Because this word of God keeps you. This is what preserves you. This is what makes you more than a conqueror. This is what holds you when your life gets rocked, when things go all wrong for you in your life. It's this word of God. It's that rock that you stand on. That rock is the word of God. And if you want to make it in this world, Revelation talks about he that endured to the end. It's an endurance on your part. You can slip off. You can get distracted. You can be deceived. But if you stay in this word of God, it's going to keep you. First Timothy 4 and, and 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This is what we are up against. This is what we are up against. And it's highlighting the fact that it's in the latter times, when it's almost over, when our redemption starts to draw real near. We don't know when it's coming, but we do know 
that there are many doctrines of devils out there teaching all types of abominations and blasphemies. We need to be in this word of God so that we have a clear understanding of what God has for us. Satan has a plan for your life and it's completely different than the plan that God has. So when I get into studying this word of God and seeking to keep myself from being deceived, seeking to grow in my walk of God, there are certain tools that I've come across that I believe work. Tool number one, precision in the use of terms. That means reading the word of God as it's written, understanding what is being said. There are many books out there right now that, that talk about um, Israel signing a treaty and talking about this last 70th week of Daniel and this tribulation period that this beast signs a treaty. That's not proper use of the terms of the scripture. The scripture says that he affirms a covenant. So what I'm talking about is precision in the use of terms. If you don't use precision, then you, anything to be used and you start to allegorize stuff and you get slowly turned off from what the real truth is. There are many books that talk about a seven year tribulation period. Scripture's clear. It's the three and a half years, it's 42 months, it's 1260 days per precision in the use of terms keeps you from being led astray, from being distracted, from not really knowing the, the truth. We need to always know that we can read this word of God now, and we have the ability to not just look at the translation that my favorite translation is the King James Version, but there are many translations, but the key word is that they are a translation. And there are translational issues that can appear in some of the daily texts. But we have at our disposal now the ability to go and find out what the text actually really says, whether it's in Hebrew or whether it's in Greek. We can find out what the word really says. And in doing that, you strengthen and you grow in your biblical literacy. This is not for people who want to be fly by the day, you know, a Sunday Christian. This is for people who are serious about their walk of God. If you're serious about your walk of God, if you're serious about being used of God, if you're serious about, about being um, effective, doing something in this kingdom, winning souls of, having victory in your daily life, you need to take God's word serious. You need to depend on this word of God like a baby is dependent on his next bottle of milk. The minute we take our eyes and think that we don't need the word of God that much, oh, I know this, I know that, then we are setting ourselves up for doctrines of devils and, and imprecise things that we tend to believe that take us away from the truth. Stick with precision in the use of terms and don't change the word of God to suit what somebody else might be thinking or somebody else might be saying. Follow what the word of God says. If you're doing that, you're never going to go wrong. This brings me to my second tool. It's understanding synonyms. Synonyms are very useful, but synonyms in the Bible can be really confusing at times. And if you do not really look deeper in these synonyms, you'll find that you're missing out on a treasure of God's word. Because I don't believe that half of the so-called synonyms in the Bible are actually synonyms in that sense because of the translation from Greek to English or even Hebrew. But I'm going to give you some examples just to give you an idea of, of what I'm saying here. And the rabbis have a word they use. They say it's a ramas. And ramas means it's a hint of something deeper. And sometimes when you come across these so-called synonyms, you'll find that it's a ramas. If you deep just a little deeper, it's a revelation, it's a nugget, it's an insight, it's a prophecy that's being set up that's being foretold. 
if we take the word of God serious, I'm here tonight to tell you is so much treasures in it, so much excitement in it. It stimulates you, it encourages you, it takes you to your next level in your walk with God. One of my favorites is Joshua 2, verses 15 to 18. Joshua 2, verses 15 to 18 is a very well-known story. It's when Joshua sends the two spies into the land and they meet Rahab. And um, verse 15 is Rahab talking. Now, Rahab says, then she let them down by a court through the window for her house was upon the town wall and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, get you to the mountains, lest the pursuers meet you and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned. And afterwards, may you go your way. And the man said unto her, we will be blameless of this, thy oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and thy father's household whom unto thee. I want to emphasize the word court in verse 15. Verse 15 says, then she let them down by a court. This is the translation that we have in English. But that word in its original in Hebrew is hebel. C-H-E-B-E-L, hebel. Better pronounced hebel. It has two meanings, and this is the importance about biblical literacy. You'll find that a lot of the Hebrew words have double meanings. The word that's written in Joshua 1 and 15 is translated as court, but it's originally written as hebel, and it means a roof or a court, but it also can mean pain, sorrow, or trouble. That's what she says. When the Holy Spirit wrote this, they wrote it as hebel, and you'll find that it's two meanings. Yes, it's a root. She's talking about a root, but the Holy Spirit uses the word hevel, which also means pain, sorrow, and travail. And when she says this to those guys, she tells them, go be three days. Then in verse 18, when the two spies get this information from her, they reply to her, behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line, okay? And the word in the Hebrew is tikva. It also means line and court, but it also means hope and expectation. And these are the little subtle things you realize the Holy Spirit does to the scripture. And I don't believe that Rahab had any idea why she said three days and why, you know, it was written that way. But when you understand how the Holy Spirit moves, you see that it's a prophecy being put in place because it's three days after the heaven of Calvary that we experience the tefa of hope and expectation. I don't believe that that's just put there. When it's written in Hebrew, that's how it's written. Both of these words in translation, when they're translated, they mean line of court. But the Holy Spirit does little stuff like that to let you know that there is a God that stands outside of time and plans stuff. So the hevel of the cross, the pain, the sorrow, and the travail, we have three days, and then we have the hope and the expectation of an empty tomb. Matter of fact, if you go to Israel, their national anthem is Hatikva, which is the hope. If you go to Israel, that's the national anthem, Hartikva, the hope. This is a little nugget that I want to bring out there in terms of synonyms, because it would appear that the word is the same word. But when you dig deeper, the Holy Spirit will reveal new truths to you. And in that, in becoming more biblical literate, it opens your eyes up. You see God in his word more, and you see that none of this stuff is just written. I'm going to go over a few things, and I want you to be able to go back 
after I've given you the stuff and check it for yourself because it'll blow your mind. The type of messages and the big girl nuggets. Remember the, the old movies they have the, the, the girl rush, everybody's looking for a girl nugget? It's big girl nuggets if you would just seek God's word. i am got another one I want to look at, which is in um, Acts 7, verse 18. Acts 7, verse 18 is when Stephen is before the Sanhedrin and has given his account. He's trying to give a message to him. It's a massive message. That's another Bible study itself. The actual message that he was given to him. Because he gives these illustrations about Israel. How Israel messed up on the first time, and then they caught it on the second time. Abraham messed up on the first time, but then he caught it on the second time. And he was getting to a point where he was going to bring out, you can see, that this saying, you let him miss the Messiah on the first time, but you'll get him on the second time. You're, you're going to know when he comes back on the second time. But in this presentation to the Sanhedrin, he's talking about, he's given this history of Israel, and then he's talking about Joseph. He, he uses this term, it says that the Jews was there, and then till another king arose, which knew not Joseph, okay? What I want to highlight for is the word another. That's what's translated to us. But in the Greek, that word there is a different word. It's spelled Heteros, heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S, heteros, okay? And that word means another of a different kind. You understand? So don't seem like as much. When you look at the other meaning of, of another, it's the word allos. Allos is actually used in Greek. It means the same thing. It means another. When you look at um, Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, it uses that same word, I'm another. And here it says, and, and another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much censers that he should offer it for the prayers of all the saints upon the altar, which was before the throne. There have been people that, wonder if this other angel is Christ. You understand? But when you look at the word and another angel is used, in the Greek, the word for another there is not heteros, it's allos. And allos, again, means it's another of the same kind. So if I had a pencil and I said, I want another pencil just like this, I would say, I want allos. Okay. I want an Ellos pencil. It means I want another pencil just like this pencil. If I say heteros, I want another pencil, but a, a red one or a green one. So in the Acts thing that Steve is talking about, he was saying that it was a different kind of Pharaoh came up after Joseph went and knew not Joseph and was treating Israel bad. You'll find in Isaiah 52, verse 4, it tells you that that Pharaoh was actually an Assyrian. He was, Pharaoh was a title now. But this guy that came up during the time of after um, Joseph, he was an Assyrian. He knew not, to not he, he, he had nothing for Joseph, nothing for the Israelites. And this set up the whole Israelites going into captivity. But what I'm saying here is, in the scripture, it's translated as another, but to get more clarity and to help you when you're dealing with um, the speculation that comes with Revelation, you'll see that in the Greek, it's talking about another angel. And when you go back to the, the previous chapter of chapter 7, you understand that these were one of the normal angels. This was a normal angel. This angel description is not a, it's not a way of talking about Christ. It's talking about the same type of angel that was just her talking in the seventh chapter. In Acts, this guy is a different kind of Pharaoh. So this is where we get more clarity when we're dealing with the word of God, okay? And I'm bringing this up. It may seem like it's nothing, but as I go on, you're going to understand that it makes a difference when we're dealing with understanding the word of God in terms of the precision in the use of terms. Whenever you want to stir a big ship around, all you do is move it just a quarter inch. And after four or five miles, it turns. And if you don't have the truth of the word of God, one small 
misunderstanding, misinterpretation, what have you believe in stuff that isn't true. There are Christians who, who have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. I'm not going to get into the actual church or anything like that, but they believe that they will be going through the tribulation period. They really believe it. They really believe it. And this is what happens when you're not got proper biblical literacy based on what we know from what's in the word of God. There is such clarity of the freedom that we have as a church from that tribulation period. But there are Christians that read the scripture and get something else. And this is what I'm talking about. Using precision in the use of terms keeps you on track and gives the Holy Spirit the, the ability to reveal new truths to you and keep you in whatever your experience is. The Holy Spirit does stuff with the word of God that when you read it, you'll just miss it. If you just read it, you'll, you'll just miss it. Everybody knows about the beautiful uh, um, challenge that Abraham had when Abraham took his son up to give him for a sacrifice. Most of us know that Abraham was acting out a prophecy with respect to the fact that on that same hill, 2,000 years later, a father would give a son, and we know that that was Jesus. That's what happens. So when, when we read the accounts of Abraham and what he's done, we see that Abraham is acting on what God is going to do with Christ. We understand that that's the very first time the word loved is ever used in the Bible. The first time the word, that word ever shows up in the Bible is in that setting when God tells him, Abraham, to take your son that you love, your only son that you love, because it's acting out a prophecy. But what I want to point you to is, after that, remember, he tells him to go take a son to this place, then the scripture, the Holy Spirit just puts in the real subtlety that it was a three-day journey from where he was when he got the uh, order from God and to where he took him. So in Abraham's eyes, Isaac was dead the minute God told him. So in Abraham's eyes, Isaac's dead for three days. Okay, He gets there, and then God, God uses that to set up this, this great being that he's going to do 2,000 years later in that very spot. If you study scripture, you'll find that it's the very spot that Jesus Christ himself was crucified in. If you go to Israel, they try to tell you that it's outside of the, the where the temple was on the side. But if you understand how they done sacrificed in this, you would have known that Abraham would have been to the top of the hill, which was called Gotham. That's the geographical location that God sent Abraham to to set up a prophecy that he would fulfill 2,000 years later. I tell you all that, but that's not my main point. My main point is when God finishes with Abraham and sends him off the hill, the text, the text says, and Abraham went off the hill and met up with his servant and they went. It does not mention Isaac. And when you continue to read the text through the next chapter, there's no mention of Isaac. It goes on to tell the story of Abraham taking his servant and sending his unnamed servant, which is a very good name that represents the Holy Spirit, this unnamed servant, to go and get Isaac a wife. But Isaac is not talked about no more. The unnamed servant goes and gets this wife, Rebecca and brings her back to him. The next time Isaac is mentioned in scripture is when he sees his bride, Rebecca. This is how the Holy Spirit does with the scripture. What you see is fulfilling our, our prophecy of Christ dying, rising again, going, and the next time Christ is seen again is when he comes for his bride. That's in the scripture. That's not contrived by me. That's not contrived by Jewish rabbis. That's in the scripture. Isaac, the Holy Spirit, added him out of the whole scripture until he's reunited with his bride. It fits the model. It fits the prophecy. And I'm telling you these things because it's excitement when you get into the word of God and you see that every sing single word, every scripture, that's in there, sometimes even numbers have relevance 
No, I have not even begun to scratch the surface in terms of all that's in there. But I'm letting you know that it's gold hunter. It's nuggets in that word of God. And the more biblical literate you are, the more you allow the Holy Spirit to reveal truths to you. That's the attitude of this word of God, the Holy Spirit. Everything in that word of God is added by the Holy Spirit to point you to Christ. And if you get into it, that's what's going to keep you. That's what's going to change you. That's what's going to make you really. I'm a fact, I have another one that's really exciting to me because it's a number one. It's a, it's a scripture that deals with numbers that you cannot overlook the fact that it's a message for us in it today. But when you read it in scripture, if you just read it, it don't really mean nothing to you. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4. This is a well-known account. This is when Noah is, is in the ark. And he gets to this point, and it says in verse 4, And the ark rested, we remember these numbers, in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Aram. You read that, and it's, okay, we came to rest on the seventeenth day of the seventh month. What do you do? But when you look deeper, in the word of God, you're going to see that it's a message in there for you. Because if you look at the Jewish calendar, you'll find that the Jews have two calendars. At this time would be the Jewish original calendar. And that month was the seventh month. Okay, this is the um, seventh month of the original calendar, Nisan. Okay, on the 17th day of that month, the ark came to rest. But when you look at Exodus 12, Exodus 12, verse 2, you'll see that God is dealing with Moses, and he tells Moses from this point on, Exodus 12 and 2 says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Okay? What you realize here is that this is God talking to Moses when he had brought them out of Egypt. And he brought them out of Egypt on the seventh month. On the 14th day of the seventh month is well known today because that day is set aside to, from Israel's even to this day as the day of Passover. So on the 14th day of the seventh month, they passed over out of Egypt. But God tells Moses here in Exodus 12 that from this day on, this month's going to be your beginning of months. So what was before in the old calendar, in the sun, it's become now your new first of the month, okay? And from that period on, right now, they celebrate the first month on the 14th day of that first month, they celebrate Passover. What you realize is that Jesus himself was crucified on the 14th day of the first month, which was before the seventh month. He was crucified in this new month called Passover. But what you find out is three days later, he rises. The 17th day of that first month, which would have been in the Old Testament, the, the 17th day of the seventh month is the new beginning in Christ. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit just, because when you read Genesis 4, it's just random. It says, well, on the 17th day of the seventh month, the Lord came to rest. But I don't believe it's a coincidence that thousands of years later, on the 17th day of that same month, the new beginning in Christ starts with us. And you'll find many places in the scripture where the Holy Spirit mentions stuff and puts stuff there. It's a scripture, Proverbs 25 and uh, Proverbs 25 and 2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal, amen, okay? And it's the honor of a king to search out the matter. God puts stuff in scripture that's concealed. But if we search it out, he would reveal it to us. I'm saying get into the word of God and take God's word serious, so serious that you realize that 
every scripture that you get into, it's got a meaning. It's got something in it for you. If you just read the word of God, just for the sake of reading the word of God, it will continue to go over your head. But God rewards those who rightly divide his word. God rewards those who was getting into his word, seeking to get truth, seeking to make change in their lives. Change in our lives cannot come from a beautiful time in church. I remember when I was very young growing up, because I used to stay up by um, Alan Temple and the uh, great legendary, I call him, Robo Lou Sr., watching him going up there sometimes and, and watching him. And I remember him saying one time, you know, it's not how high you jump on Sunday, it's how straight you're going to walk on Monday. And that's the difference in our lives. The only way we can walk straight on Monday is because of the word of God. It's because after I left that beautiful church experience, we go to the word of God and become knowledgeable. We take on the word of God with a mindset that is going to change our lives and it's going to help us to be what God what, what have us to be. There's one more nugget that I want to bring out and then I'm going to try to quickly get into this last part here so that I don't drag it on too much. And this is another famous one, well-known one. It's Genesis 1, verse 5. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. We, we read that, and I want to highlight that the word evening in Hebrew is Abba, and the, the word morning is actually Boca in Hebrew. And what I want you to look at is the actual meaning of Abba. Abba represents in this text, evening. It's being translated as evening. But Abba actually means um, it's an obstruction, it's a mixture increasing in tropy. When encroaching darkness begins to deny you the ability to discern forms, shapes, and, and identities, it sets up what's better known as evening or twilight. That's what it's you know translated in. But it also, it also in that understanding there, you, you are looking at confusion. You are looking at what's disorder. So when the term Avra is used, it becomes evening because evening represents that time of the night where you can see and things are becoming disordered. You can get clarity. The other one is Boca, morning. In the morning, it says things are becoming discernible, distinguishable, visible, perception in order, relief of obscurity, decrease in entropy. You are able to make out shapes and forms. It's also used, because of that terminology, it's mostly related to morning and dawn. You can see what's going on proper. But the main thing you need to understand is it's clarity. It's everything's in order. So when you read Genesis 1 and 5 again, you have to look at it carefully because it will disturb you when you know what a day is. It says, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the obscurity, the disorder, the invoker, order, and the sun. So when you read that verse, it would better read in terms of because of the fact that, that those two words have double meanings. Yes, it becomes more well known for evening and morning, but the evening and ever also represents disorder. So when you read that scripture, it makes more sense, especially when you get to day seven, because when you get to day seven, you have no ever and boca. You have no evening and morning. It just says that he rested on the seventh day. But every other day when God was, was doing work, the ever and boca was the first day. So if you read it, it would read, the disorder and order was day one. The disorder and order was day two. The disorder and order was day three. Because we know that a day is not an evening. Because in the evening and the morning, is only 12 hours. That's only 12 hours. That's not a day. So what does that word really mean? The avra and the boca, the disorder and the order that God bought her was the first day. And I'm only bringing it up 
just to show you that if you look deeper, there's a lot more clarity in the word of God. If you seek it, if you seek it, there is nuggets of understanding in God's word if you have that hunger and that desire to take God's word seriously. You have to have a proper love and appreciation for the word of God because that's what's going to make the difference. The Holy Spirit is not going to waste its time on people who don't want to learn, who don't want to go to that next level in their walk with him. If they're satisfied with just going to church and just reading a couple of scriptures and just throwing them a couple of prayers, then that's what you will continue to do. But if you want to take your walk with God to that next level, if you want change in your life, you've got to take the word of God serious on a personal level. Not when you go to church, not in Bible study like now, on your own, at your own time. Your own personal training is what's going to bring that true development of your life. I want to bring up uh, um, point number three real quickly here. It's called hermeneutical hygiene. It's a fancy word. It simply means it's your uh, approach and your guidelines for, for what you use to interpret scripture. And the hygiene is the discipline that's involved when you do it. You have to have a high view of the word of God. That way you can get into the word of God and keep it with that proper um, appreciation and respect and sacredness that it de deserves to actually make you different to actually reveal truth to you if i was to talk about the the attributes of the word of god there are things i know we all would agree with um we would believe it's true we, we, we would believe it's infallible we would believe it's trustworthy we would also believe that this word of god is even god breathed that's important that's important that we have this mindset if that's what you really believe then you need to take the word of god seriously because when you get into this word of God, you need to understand that there are things in the word of God that help protect us from stuff. We live in a time now where we can take the word of God and get legitimate inferences based on the word of God, gates of hell, okay? That's a portal. It's not a lot of scripture in it, but we can legitimately infer from Matthew 16, when Jesus said that the gates of hell shall not prevail. So it's a gate there. It's a gateway that they are not able to get caught. How and, and, and death and what does the, the power of the spirits go to? We, we look at Luke 16, where it talks about the, the sick guy, Lazarus, and the rich man that dies, and Abraham's bosom. So we can, we can infer certain stuff about that. We don't have a full knowledge of it, but we can infer that there is a separation that's going on there. We read Daniel 10, and we hear about spiritual warfare. One angel was coming to give Daniel a message, and he was held up for three weeks fighting against one of Satan's angels. And it was only when Michael the archangel came and helped him, he was able to actually come to Daniel. And that's what Daniel gets into the 21-day fast. Most scholars believe that if, if Daniel didn't keep fasting, Maybe that guy wouldn't have even made it through. But Daniel fasted the whole 21 days. And then the angel comes and tells him that he was in a spiritual battle. So we know that there are spiritual warfares going on. So that's a legitimate inference. We don't know a lot about it. But what we do know is in the word of God. There are many books being written about spiritual warfares and speculation and stuff. We don't want to take our truths from these speculative sources. Our truth has always got to be what the word of God says. Because the minute you stop depending on the word of God as an actual truth, then you're open to all types of speculations that can lead you down to this world of deception that's waiting for us. We live in a time right now where there are many, many new things coming out where we are dealing with different names that we have never heard of time travel, portals. These are things that serious scholars, serious mathematicians are out there now saying that they have discovered black holes and wormholes. These are new vocabularies that, that we are taking on. And there are people talking about it as if they really knew about it. What they do know, we don't know if it's true. It might be true, but it may not be true. But what it does, 
it can open up doors that lead Christians into crazy beliefs. Time travel, can we travel back in time? All our truths, all our dependence has to be on the word of God. If not, if you get into these profane sources, these secular speculations and stuff that are done by some very bright and intelligent people, what they claim to know is it's still speculative. It's not proven yet. But we as children of God have to depend on our truth coming from the word of God. There is so much talk right now of conspiracy theorists as it relates to the COVID and, and the vaccine and all this type of stuff. And, and some Christians are getting unsettled by it. I remember learning a long time ago that uh, um, when the bank people deal with teaching their staff how to deal with fake money, they don't get too caught up in the fake money. They just show them what the real stuff is. So once you concentrate on the real, you ain't got to worry about this fake stuff. You ain't got to worry about it. If you get into the word of God, you're going to have the truth. The truth, the Holy Spirit is always going to reveal the truth to you. If you're in it, it'll show you the truth. And that light shines on that darkness. It shines on that cockroach of deception. And it keeps you grounded in God. And that's what I want to, to actually highlight as much as I can. I want to wrap up now with the exhortation that each of us take the mindset that we are personally going to take our walk with God to that next level. That is only possible, not by doing church walks, not by being like the Ephesians, you know, being going on a whole lot of doctrines and all that type of stuff. Personal relationship, personal relationship. If you want to really be effective, if you want to be pleasing God, if you want to really grow, You've got to get into the word of God. You've got to seek God's word. It's many truths. What I've done, I haven't even scratched the surface in terms of so many nuggets, so many prophecies that are set up in people's lives that are foretold and are put there so that you would recognize truth. You, you will recognize that God was always and is always in control. So that when you're in the middle of a battle, with your life, whether it's a physical battle, it's a marriage battle, it's a job battle, whatever you're facing, whatever crisis in your life, this word of God, when, when you're rooted and grounded in it, is going to help you be like Jesus Christ in the middle of that massive storm on the Galilee Lake. Jesus was sleeping. And his disciples woke up and said, well, you don't curl up, we're going to die. Jesus was sleeping. And we can rest in God, when we're facing the most terrible things in our lives, if we've got a proper understanding of the word of God, Elijah asked for a double portion from Elijah. He got it. Elijah done four great miracles. Elijah done double. It's a reason. He got a double portion from God. But what happened? Elijah ran up to God in a chariot fame. He ran up, no problems. Elijah done great things, many great things, but you'll find that in the end, Elijah got sick of a disease and he died. He got sick of a disease and he died. No matter how great he was, he still died. He still suffered. In this walk for God, we can determine what our success is. Our success is in giving ourselves over to the will of God. And a lot of times in doing it, you're not going to look like a winner. You're not going to look successful. You're going to suffer. Any true child of God is going to face um, trials and stuff. But Elijah ended up dying and couldn't heal himself. He died of his illness. But I want to tell you that he was so powerful that when they buried him, somebody made a mistake one day and threw a dead person in his grave. That dead person hit the bottom of the grave and jumped up and came back alive. These are not stories. These are not just fables. This is mighty man of God. They threw this dead guy in Elijah's grave because they got scared of some animus that they saw coming. So they quickly just threw him in the grave. He hit that grave and the power of Elijah from God was still in it, even in his bones. That this guy came back alive. I'm telling you that we still serve that God today. Get into his word and let him excite you as he reveals himself to you. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Amen.